I am Brian Champion, the political science and world politics librarian and coordinator of the House of Learning Lectures. We welcome students, colleagues, faculty, and invited guests here today to hear from Professor Chad Emmett of the Department of Geography deliver a lecture entitled, Taking Root, The Growth of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints in Indonesia. The library sponsors two main lectures and lecture series the House of Learning Lecture Series, and the Alice Louise Reynolds Women in Scholarship Lecture. Through these lectures, the library brings together scholars and students to engage in a civil discussion of ideas, and in so doing, the library contributes to building a learned community which fosters the faithful life of the mind. The House of Learning Lecture Series title is taken from the 88th section of the Doctrine and Covenants, verse 119, where the Lord instructs the saints to prepare every needful thing, even a house of learning. Because the library is the campus repository for the literature of all academic disciplines and scholarship, the library is well positioned to be considered BYU's house of learning. The Harold B. Lee Library takes seriously its campus role as the intellectual heart of inquiry and knowledge and is honored to provide this house of learning lecture today. Now, about today's lecturer. Professor Chad Emmett earned a baccalaureate degree in secondary education from Utah State University and an MA in International Relations and Middle East Studies from BYU in 1983. He continued his graduate work at the University of Chicago, where he earned a PhD in geography in 1991. His interests in the Middle East and Islamic studies have a long genealogy. His dissertation at Chicago was entitled, The Christian and Muslim Communities and Quarters of the Arab City of Nazareth. And the University of Chicago published his 1995 book entitled, Beyond the Basilica, Christians and Muslims in Nazareth. His research has been published as articles in several distinguished journals, and his current research interests include the political influences on the spread of Christianity in Indonesia, a history of the LDS Church in Indonesia, the status of Christians in the Islamic world, and the relationship between the status of women and the stability and security of states. In addition to his scholarly works, Professor Emmett is a stellar example of student-centered mentoring, committed to providing inspired and inspiring direction to undergraduate and graduate students alike. It is a great pleasure today to welcome Professor Chad Emmett. Thank you. I'm honored to have been invited to give a House of Learning lecture today. My topic today is one that is dear to my heart. 30 years ago this month, I began my missionary service by entering the Provo LTM to study Indonesian. I knew nothing of the history of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints in Indonesia at that time. Since then, I have come to know much about the workings of the Lord and of the growth of the church in that tropical archipelago. I thank Professor Lanny Bridge for inspiring me to document the growth of the church. When his book, Nothing More Heroic, The Compelling Story of the First Latter-day Saint Missionaries in India, was published a few years ago, I was touched by the diligent efforts of the early missionaries in India over a century and a half ago. As I as I heard Professor Bridge talk about these individuals, I realized that equally heroic peoples have helped to establish the church in Indonesia and that their story did not need to wait 150 years to be told. Indonesia is a beautiful land of tropical rainforests, volcanoes, rice paddies, spices, and big modern cities. It is the fourth most populous country in the world and, is, and it is the largest Islamic country in the world. The story of the church in Indonesia is unique in that Indonesia is one of the few Islamic, Islamic majority countries in the world where the LDS church is officially recognized and where convert baptisms are allowed. It has not always been easy, but through the years with the help of merchants and missionaries, politicians and humanitarians, much process has been made and strong roots have been established. 
To understand the diffusion of Mormonism in Indonesia, we need to first understand the diffusion of many other religions into this syncretic and multi-religious land. To be brief, Hindu and Buddhist traders brought their religions to what was an animus land nearly 2,000 years ago. Hindu and Buddhist kingdoms prevailed for centuries. Islam then entered the islands via Aceh, the veranda of Mecca, beginning in the 13th century. Gradually via coastal trading ports and then into the interior of many of the, many of the islands, Islam peacefully supplanted Hinduism and Buddhism, excepting Bali that still remains Hindu. Islam was still on the move when Portuguese merchants brought Catholicism to the Eastern Spice Islands in the beginning of the 16th century. They were followed in the 17th century by the Dutch, who reluctantly, if it did not get in the, in the way of profit, brought Protestantism. The continuous flow of religions into the region left the Dutch East Indies with strong and varied religious communities. This diversity led to a fundamental schism within Indonesian society about what the nature of an independent state should be. Muslim nationalists wanted an Islamic state, while Sukarno and others struggled for a more inclusive state with greater religious freedom. Sukarno and his supporters eventually prevailed, and Indonesia was founded as a Panchasila state, the five founding principles on which Indonesia is um, based. Um, and the first founding principle of Panchasila, you can see on the top, um, Ketuhanan Yang Maha Isa means a belief in one supreme being. So the idea was that all um, people in Indonesia, no matter what their religion, would believe in one supreme being. Um, the Panchasila also recognized five official religions, Islam, Protestantism, Catholicism, Buddhism, Hindu, and Hinduism. If, if the Muslim nationalists had won the battle, and if Indonesia had emerged as a Sharia state, then Mormon and other missionaries may not have been permitted to enter the country. A communist coup in 1965 led to the fall of Sukarno. His successor, General Suharto, also rejected the idea of Islam being a state religion. The communist coup that brought Suharto to power had lasting impact on Christianity in the country. It is estimated that in the aftermath of the bloody massacres that followed the coup, as many as one million Muslims on Java converted to some form of Christianity. Following a long history of religious diffusion and conversion, the establishment of a pluralist, pluralistic state, and the political upheavals that compelled peoples to seek comfort in religion, the late 1960s seemed to be an ideal time for the LDS Church to enter Indonesia. One couple was in the right place at the right time to help. During World War II, Maxine Tate from Tooele, Utah, served with the Red Cross in the Philippines. There she met and married Pete Grimm. Following the war, they remained in Southeast Asia and set up a profitable shipping company. Throughout the 1950s and 60s, Pete and Maxine Grimm would travel throughout Indonesia on their boat, the Lanakai. In her travels, Maxine would always, was always a missionary, distributing cases of the Book of Mormon in both Dutch and English and other church pamphlets that she would hand out to harbor masters and merchants in every port the Lanakai visited. On one stop in Jakarta, they met Jan Walando, shown here in the center with the dark glasses, a Christian from northern Sulawesi and a close friend of President Sukarno and Suharto. And just by way of information, the man on the left is um, Ludi Vanderhoven, the first branch president in Jakarta, and the man on the right is G. Carlos Smith, the mission president of the Southeast Asian mission when Indonesia was, or was, became a, um, a mission, um, part of the Singapore mission. Um, Jan Walando, um, in talking with the Grimms, um, well, the Grimms channeled most of their, let me go back, the Grimms channeled most of their um, business through Jan Walando, and he became a close confidant and a close friend with the, the Grimms, and he and Maxine would have religious discussions, and um, Jan Walando at one point expressed a desire to be the first Mormon um, to be baptized in Indonesia. During one trip to U the U.S., Walando even met Apostle Ezra Tap Benson and encouraged him to send Mormons to Indonesia. Sister Grimm also encouraged leaders of the church to consider open up, opening up missionary work in Indonesia. In 1969, Sister Grimm arranged for Jan Walando to help President Brent Hardy of the Hong Kong-based Southern Far East Mission to navigate and negotiate the inner workings of the Indonesian government. Permission was granted. On Sunday, October 26, 1969, Elder Ezra Taft Benson dedicated the land for missionary work. He was accompanied by Elder Bruce R. McConkie. At the time, at the time of the dedication, there was only one Indonesian member, Sutrisno. He had come to know the church through two LDS professors who had spent time teaching in Indonesia. The rest of the LDS community was made up of several expatriate families living in Jakarta. 
The first six missionaries from the newly established Southeast Asia Mission, headquartered in Singapore, entered Indonesia and Jakarta on, Jakarta, on January 5, 1970. They entered with no language training and no published, published church materials. Much of their time was spent on getting materials translated and formalizing all of the necessary legalities. Over the next few years, eight branches were established in the eight major cities of Java. For the first few years, the missionaries were allowed to go door to door, but then in early 1974, a countrywide ban on door to door contacting was enforced. Since then, missionaries have had to rely on meeting people through member, refer member referrals, through teaching English classes and participating in service activities, or while riding buses, shopping, visiting a park or zoo, asking directions, or any other creative way to start a conversation and eventually end up with an invitation to visit them in their homes to talk about religion. The growth of the church during this period was slow but steady. The average baptismal rate was usually about three baptisms per missionary per year. Here you can see a group of converts in 1976. The one on the far right giving the thumbs up is Subandrio, at the time known as Yo-Yo. At the time of his conversion, he was a fun-loving kid of 19 who was fellowshipped into the church by members. Now he is an Area Authority 70 who has been using his experience from church service in Indonesia to help guide the young and rapidly growing church in Cambodia. In the first four years, 98 foreign elders were called to serve in Indonesia. They entered without troubles. However, beginning in August 1974, three groups of missionaries had difficulty getting visas and ended up staying in, in the Hawaii LTM and even the Hawaii mission for several extra months before finally getting permission to enter Indonesia. Once the entry problem was cleared up, visa problems shifted to remaining in the country. All foreign elders called to Indonesia from 1976 on were required to go out of the country every six months for visa renewals. This exodus every few months to Singapore disrupted missionary work, but it gave missionaries a chance to enjoy a &W root beer and hamburgers. The first two local missionaries, and you can see one of those two, Elder Suharto, um, were called in 1975. And in July of that year, the Indonesia Jakarta Mission was formed with Hendrik Hout as president. He was a Dutchman who was born and raised in colonial Indonesia. The next year, the first welfare service sister missionaries began serving. In the right photo, in the center, you see Mary Ellen, Sister Mary Ellen Edmonds, who was serving her third mission at the time to help get started the welfare service program. Her companions are Sister Darcy on her right and Sister Endong on her left. In an effort to build better government relations and to help educate Latter-day Saint children, the church established an elementary school in Jakarta in 1976. Here you can see the principal and teachers, and here you can see the pupils dressed in their traditional finery for the dedication ceremonies. The tolerance for Christian missionary activity during the first decade of Suharto's rule fostered frustration among Muslims. While Suharto saw missionaries as state-building tools, particularly among animist people in the less developed regions of the country, Muslims saw the success of these missionaries as a threat to ever achieving an Islamic state. Pressure from an increasingly active Muslim community prompted the Minister of Religion in August 1978 to issue two decrees to severely limit the ability of foreign missionaries to work in Indonesia. Islamic groups welcomed the new decrees because they specifically targeted Christian missionary activities. Christian groups, however, felt as if the decrees were unfair because it weakened the founding concept of freedom of religion. Christians also emphasized that many of the Javanese Muslim converts to Christianity were Muslims in name only, and that Christianity was therefore not a threat to two true followers of Islam. In October of 1978, the Indonesian Council of Churches issued a message calling for a return to true religious freedom by acknowledging the universalizing nature of religions and the requirements therewith to engage in missionary activities. The implementation of the decrees was not instantaneous, in part because of the vocal Christian opposition which led to the suspension of the decrees in January 1979. Even with the temporary suspension in place, the government was still gradually able to cut back on foreign missionary influence by not issuing new visas or visa extensions. It was not a systematic process, and so while some missionaries were leaving Indonesia due to the government denying them visa extensions, other missionaries were entering the country on new short-term visas. For example, 44 Mormon missionaries began their two-year missionary service in Indonesia during 1979, while well, during the same year, 32 missionaries serving in Indonesia had to leave the country early due to the fact that their visas were not renewed. Many of these missionaries were reassigned to the Philippines. In an attempt to keep the missionaries in Indonesia for their full two-year terms, 
The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints sent David M. Kennedy as a special emissary to lobby the Indonesian government. He was retired, but during his tenure as U.S. Secretary of the Treasury, he had worked with Indonesian officials on monetary matters and was highly respected in the country. On several visits to Indonesia, Kennedy met with such high-ranking government officials as the Foreign Minister and the Minister of Religion. He was often promised more visas or extended visas for missionaries, but these promises seldom came to fruition. The final foreign, the final foreign Mormon missionaries left Indonesia in August 1981. For the next 20 years, the church in Indonesia was solely an indigenous church with only limited outside help. Amazingly, in family after family, all the children chose to serve missions. For example, all seven of the Noni children seen here in a 1977 photo grew up and went on missions, proudly noted by their widowed mother in a 2002 photo. And all six of the Hamid children, the five oldest of which are seen at the left in the, this 1975 photo, chose to go on missions. On the right are five of those six children with their widowed mother, mother, mother in a 2002 photo. In the 1980s and 1990s, mission governance ping-ponged from Singapore to Jakarta to Singapore, and then finally back to Jakarta. When the mission was headquartered in Singapore, one counselor always served from Jakarta with the task of overseeing local missionary work. One of the first of these counselors was Pete Tandiman, who joined the church in 1970 in Jakarta when the first six elders went hunting for a local attorney to help them. His eldest son, Yuswan, on the back right, also served as a mission counselor and then later as a mission president. While foreign elders were not allowed to serve during the 1990s, foreign senior couples did serve in Indonesia in a modified way. They entered the country with regular work visas and spent much of their time giving service in the form of teaching dentistry or medicine at universities. These couples helped build bridges and provided fellowshipping and leadership in the church. Current gov government attitudes toward foreign mission missionaries have somewhat ameliorated in the past few years. This softening of restrictions began during the administration of President Abdurrahman Wahid, who served as Indonesia's fourth president from October 1999 to July 2001. President Wahid was deep, deeply ecumenical and tolerant of all religions, while at the same time he was passionate about Islam, evidenced in part by his longtime service as the leader of Nadlatul Ulama, Indonesia's largest Islamic organization. His egalitarian views meant that he was supportive of a non-sectarian estate, a non-sectarian state as espoused by the Panchasila, while his devotion to Islam led him to support a non-secular state where the dominant religion, namely Islam, was an important element of society. Wahid's openness to all religions is evidenced by his January 2000 lifting of the 1967 ban on the practice of Confucianism and the government's June 2001 lifting of its 25-year-old ban on Jehovah Witnesses. In the mid-1990s, Wahid met Hal Jensen, an LDS businessman who had long-term dealings in Indonesia. Jensen, Jensen arranged to meet with Wahid to ask him a question about how a certain project would fare among Muslims. In that meeting, Wahid offered Jensen some tea. Jensen gave his standard reply, no thank you, I don't drink tea, I'm a Mormon. When Wahid heard that Jensen was a Mormon, he proceeded to tell Jensen all he knew about the religion. For a Muslim from Indonesia, his knowledge was extensive due to his very ecumenical views and through his experiences as one of the founding members and current chairman of the World Council of Churches. The Mormon and Muslim discussed religion for several hours, and then Wahid invited Je Jensen back for many future visits. From these initial meetings, the two men developed a strong friendship based in part on their strong religious beliefs and from their shared antipathy for the rampant corruption found in Indonesia. Back in the United States, Jensen visited with President Packer and told him about Wahid. His poor eyes, his leadership of Indonesia's largest Islamic organization, his being president of the World Council of Churches, his involvement in Indonesian politics, and his potential to become president. President Packer obviously expressed an interest in meeting Wahid and offered to help arrange for the operation. President Packer then contacted Dr. Randall Olson at the Moran Eye Center at the University of Utah and requested that he arrange for an eye operation. Wahid was accompanied on his visit to Salt Lake City by Awi Shihab, the third man from the left in this photo, um, who at the time was teaching Islamic law at Harvard and who later would serve as Wahid's foreign minister. When Wahid arrived in Salt Lake City, he received a blessing from Elder Neil A. Maxwell, had the operation, which offered only little improvement in one eye, and then met with the first presidency, at which time President Hinckley also gave um, Wahid a blessing. 
Why he'd also traveled to BYU for Saturday lunch with faculty and leaders, as shown in this photo. Wahid then returned to Indonesia, where he jumped back into the unpredictable and oftentimes troubled political landscape. Two months after his visit to Salt Lake City, Wahid surprisingly emerged victorious as the first truly democratically elected president of the world's newest and third largest democracy. Less than a month later, Wahid embarked on his first major international trip. One of these stops was Salt Lake City for a follow-up appointment at the Moran Eye Center. During this visit, he once again stayed in Hal Jensen's Deer Valley home, where he used part of his time to finalize the formation of his government. He was also able to meet for a second time with President Hinckley. During this visit, Wahid extended a presidential inv invitation to President Hinckley and President Packer to visit Indonesia at his, as his official guest. They accepted the in invitation. Plans were put into place and a visit to Indonesia was included on the itinerary, itinerary of President Hinckley's January 2000 trip to the Western Pacific region. Then in December of 1999, Christian Muslim conflicts flared again in the Maluku Islands and on, on, and on the island of Lombok. Given the growing sectarian unrest in certain parts of the country, church secu security was obviously concerned about the safety of President Hinckley. On January 19, 2000, at 11 o'clock p.m. Jakarta time, President Hinckley's secretary, Don Staley, called Mission President Subandrio, a young-looking energi young energizer bunny is how I would describe him. Um, this is just a few years before that call would have been made. Um, so um, President Subandrio got a call from Don Staley to discuss security concerns about the planned visit. Brother Staley told Subandrio that the brethren were currently in a meeting and that after the meeting, President Hinckley would like to talk to him. As recorded in an email message, Subandrio then told Staley, I will wait for the prophet's call if it takes the whole night. Subandrio goes on to relate, quote, after I hang up the phone, I was nervous, worrying that the visit would be canceled. So I prayed very, very hard, pleading to the Lord that he will tell the prophet to come and take care of our country's problems. At 1.30 a.m., President Hinckley's secretary called and told me that President Hinckley wanted to talk to me. President Hinckley asked me about the security situation in Indonesia. I told him that there is a problem. However, when he comes, he will bring peace, good news, and blessings to the saints and the country. So I told him, please come. He said, okay, I will come. I'll see you in Jakarta. In Indonesian culture, and in particular Javanese culture, there is a distinct hierarchy that requires underlings to be subservient and respectful to elders. If Subandrio had chosen to act in a true Javanese way, he would never have been so bold or so un-Javanese as to directly tell President Hinckley what to do. He would have humbly said something on, along the lines of, do whatever you think is best, President Hinckley. But Subandrio was no longer a typical Javanese underling. He was a seasoned Mormon and a mission president who understood that his calling and responsibility in the church necessitated that he give sincere counsel when counsel was sought. President Hinckley was true to his word, and in January 2000, he became, the, he became the first president of the church to visit Indonesia. He and President Packer spoke at the gathering of 1,800 Latter-day Saints. They also met with President Wahid. President Hinckley had asked President Subandrio if he had any special requests for President Wahid. Subandrio, with a local missionary force of only a few dozen, requested foreign missionaries be allowed to enter the country again. The request was conveyed and surprisingly, Wahid agreed. It took a while to negotiate the bureaucracy, but finally in early 2001, the calls came. They came to eight unsuspecting, hand-picked elders from Canada, Germany, and Australia who had already been serving for up to eight months in various missions of the Western United States. These young elders were called in by their mission presidents on a Friday and told that they were being reassigned to the Indonesia Jakarta mission and that they were to report on Monday to the MTC, again, for two months of Indonesian training. There were no recently returned missionaries to teach at the MTC, so Sister Anna Butler, from this 1977 photo, she's in the red bandana, um, she was recruited along with three graduate students from Indonesia to do the teaching. It was a rare occurrence to have three LDS Indonesians at BYU at that time. Sister Butler is a native of Jakarta who, like several other converts from the mid-1970s, mid initially became interested in the church through her membership in the Osman Fan Club. 
Sister Butler, seen here with fellow interpreters at the Conference Center, has spent the last 27 years helping teach at the MTC and coordinating Indonesian interpretation for the church. It is a good thing she saw the wholesome looking Osman family on the cover of an Indonesian magazine years ago. The second group of missionaries, the second group of four missionaries called out of U.S. missions to serve in Indonesia included Willem Suko on the left. His mission service included the MTC, New Jersey, for a few months, then back to the MTC for two months of language training, Indonesia for a few months, and then following the fall 2001 U.S. invasion of Afghanistan, a precautionary transfer to Australia for a few months, and then back to Indonesia to finish out his mission. Initially, the Indonesian government offered 18 visas for elders and visas for 18 senior service couples. Initially, the elders went in as religious experts who had helped train local members. One was listed as a Bible expert, another as a Book of Mormon expert, another as a music expert. They were, they were and still are required to be companioned with a local Indonesian elder. In recent years, the image of the church in Indonesia has been positively benefited by the ongoing humanitarian humanitarian efforts of the church, especially those associated with the many natural disasters that have struck poor, seismically challenged Indonesia. One such, benef one such positive benefit occurred following the November 2004 earthquake in the eastern island of Alor. The church provided relief funds directly to Dr. Alwi Shihab's governmental ministry. This friendship with Shihab had grown out of his initial meeting with church leaders when he visited Salt Lake City with Abdul Rahman Wahid in 1999. Shihab was impressed that this was the first Christian church to offer relief to the Muslims in Alor. Up to this point, all humanitarian aid dispensed in Indonesia was done under the cryptic name of LDS Charities. But Shihab chose instead to identify the giver of the aid by the full name of the church, Gereja Yesus Christus Dari Orang Orang Suci Zaman Akhir. From that reference onward, the full name of the church has been used in correspondence on shipping documents on boxes and pallets at airports and in interaction with government and non-governmental agencies. Later, when aid was delivered to tsunami survivors in Aceh, they noticed Church of Jesus Christ on all of the boxes. When later boxes arrived, one man was heard to exclaim that another donation from the Jesus Church had arrived. Shortly after the devastating December 26, 2004 tsunami off the coast of Aceh, in which an estimated 170,000 Indonesians perished, the LDS Church started a major and continuing relief and rebuilding effort. By chance or by miracle, nine pallets of medical supplies were already in Jakarta. They were part of a shipment only a few weeks earlier of eye surgery equipment for another project in Jakarta, and someone in Salt Lake was inspired to fill the remainder of the, remainder of the container with medical supplies. In addition, two full containers of clothing that had been shipped to Indonesia six months earlier for another project had only just the week before cleared customs and were in country ready for the greater need in Aceh. A plane load of supplies was shipped from Salt Lake City. Additional supplies were loaded. Um, it contained 84,000 pounds of food, 36,000 pounds of clothing, 41,000 pounds of medical supplies, and 42,000 hygiene kits. The landing of the plane was a minor miracle. Listen to the reporting of Elder Tom Palmer, a humanitarian service missionary couple, missionary serving in Jakarta at the time. He writes, this plane was headed for Maidan, Indonesia, and was told in flight that it would be unable to land there. Elder Subandrio, Gary Flake, and I were in Maidan's Polonia Airport to meet the plane and in cooperation with Islamic relief officials in Indonesia to provide distribution of the needed, onto the needed destinations. We were advised that one, there was no proper unloading equipment, two, there was no longer a time slot for the plane at the congested airport because it was delayed, three, there were cargo planes that needed unloading to open the way, and four, there were two other planes that were scheduled to arrive and we could not land unless they failed to show. He goes on to write, we witnessed the hand of the Lord through his servants to clear the way for the landing. A time slot was made, a cargo plane unloaded, and two planes failed to show. With a, in a very short time of our arrival at the airport, the Lord was in charge of this international airport with Elder Subandrio directing the work. From the air traffic control tower to the security guards to the airport tarmac patrol, all were responsive to Elder Subandrio as we freely walked among planes in and out of secured areas, interacting frequently and directly with the tower. We joined hands with an unloading crew and the local missionaries to help unload a Russian cargo plane that had to be unloaded within two hours or our plane could not land. In two hours, the plane was unloaded to the amazement of their crew and the air 
to the amazement of their crew and airport officials. Just as we left the cargo bay of this plane, we witnessed that our plane had arrived. Initially, they were going to refuse any unloading due to in inadequate equipment, but they, say our, but they saw our determination and witnessed the unloading of the lower cargo bay by hand. A missionary in white shirt and tie on one end of a 100-pound bale of clothing and a Muslim brother on the other, we unloaded bell after bell. The crew of the airplane was so impressed with our young elders, they sent from the cockpit before their departure a package of goodies from the U.S., end, end quote. These supplies were augmented with local purchases, which included food, water, water containers, medical supplies, and clothing, as well as 9,700 locally assembled kits, 50,000 body bags, 3,000 sleeping bags, 1,000 kitchen sets, handheld communication devices, and 100 motorbikes for medical personnel to use in traveling to isolated areas. For the next two and a half years, supplies arrived and projects were implemented. Other projects included uh, medical and surgical equipment for 10 hospitals, three ambulances, four vehicles, laundry equipment, um, dental unit, temporary housing for 50 single mothers, five school buses for displaced children, sewing machines for 900 families, sports and recreation equipment, trauma counseling and training, rehabil rehabilitation training and equipment, water and sanitation systems for 20 villages, um, a water purification system for an orphanage, 46 hospital beds, dental services for orphans, a water treatment system for an Islamic school, library books and computers for four schools, and the construction of um, 900 family homes. One of, the one of the other successful projects overseen by Elder and Sister Ham, shown in the lower right, included dragging washed up boats to shore, fixing them, and then outfitting them with new nets and new motors. 84 boats have been repaired and have enabled hundreds of men to get back to work. These projects were done in cooperation with either an Indonesian government ministry or agency, including the Office of the First Lady, the Ministry of Health, and the Ministry of Social Welfare, with local Islamic organizations, including Wahid's Nadlatul Ulama, the State Institute of Islamic Studies, and the Foundation for Islamic Education, and with international relief agencies and organizations, including Islamic Relief Worldwide, Adventist Development and Relief Agency, International Organization for Migration, and the Austin International Rescue and Relief Operations. In May 2006, $1.6 million in supplies were sent by the church to Central Java in cooperation with Islamic Relief International following a devastating earthquake. Once again, local members and missionaries provided food and relief kits and help for the afflicted. The aid has not gone without notice. Church leaders from both Indonesia and church headquarters are now well known and highly appreciated in Indonesia. President Packer and Elder Bednar traveled to Indonesia in February 2005 to monitor tsunami relief and to meet with government officials. They were able to tour Jakarta's largest mosque, and with the approval of the head cleric, President Packer offered a prayer in which he, quote, blessed the mosque and all who attend to pray and worship. Last October, Alwi Shihab, who is now serving as the presidential advisor and special envoy to the Middle East, came to BYU and delivered a forum address. He was warmly introduced by President Packer. Both men spoke of their friendship and mutual respect and of the need to be tolerant and understanding of other religions. Early, earlier this year, President and Sister Jensen, the, newly re the recently released mission presidents, and Elder and Sister Peterson, the recently released um, humanitarian service directors, um, were able to visit with the First Lady of Indonesia who thanked the church for all of its assistance some of which has helped fund projects of the First Lady's office. Just last month, I witnessed a district-wide enrichment activity in which Relief Society sisters and young women of the Jakarta district gathered in the South Jakarta Chapel to make 300 comfort pillows in anticipation of the next natural disaster. Last week, I received word that these pillows have been included in church aid now being dispersed in West Sumatra following the September 12th earthquake in Benkulu. And the woman who organized this, twice now they've made blankets or pillows in anticipation and there's always an earthquake shortly thereafter so she's beginning to wonder if she should stop anticipating. <laughs> the church was very careful not to mix missionary work with humanitarian work. No missionary work was ever allowed in very Islamic Aceh and unlike some other Christian aid efforts no religious materials were sent in along with the relief supplies. Since the beginning of the LDS tsunami relief the number of visas for LDS missionaries has increased from 36 to 54, 
with each senior couple counting for only one visa. No visas were asked for or promised as part of the relief effort, but apparently the improved Mormon governmental relations have made it possible to request and receive additional missionary visas. Currently in Indonesia, there are 10 senior couples serving, both humanitarian and proselyting, 31 foreign elders and sisters, and 31 local elders and sisters for a total of 82 missionaries, which if you go back to this, um, we're now at 82, which was the maximum they had back in, the 19, back in 1979. So we're back up to where they once were um, due to the increase over the last year or so. The two elders at the right are Elder Kaipo, a Maori from New Zealand, and Elder Subadi from Solo, Central Java. The two sisters at the left are Sister Edder from Colorado. She is half Navajo and a graduate of Stanford University. Her companion is Sister Daisy Korniawati, also from Solo. Daisy is the daughter of Sister Darcy, seen on the left of Sister Edmonds, one of the first two Indonesian sisters to serve a mission. Darcy, who was a companion, Darcy was a companion with Mary Ellen Edmonds. Sister Darcy raised Daisy as a single mom. Sister Darcy died of diabetes a few years ago, leaving Daisy an orphan. Daisy received no mail the first few months of her mission because of no family members to, to support her. She then got permission to contact Sister Edmund, who upon, Edmonds, who upon learning of Sister Korniawati's plight and out of love for her mother, decided to act as a surrogate mission mom, sending her weekly emails and packages. Currently, church membership is about 6,000 with 21 branches in 10 cities. There are three districts and one mission. All of this goodwill and gradual growth does not mean that it is now clear sailing in Indonesia. The Christian minority still has to deal with the limitations of existing in a Muslim country. In addition, the church also has to deal with the perception among most Indonesian Christians that it is a false church. Challenges in getting church buildings approved and built illustrate these challenges. In the East Jakarta suburb of Bekasi, which now has two branches, the church encountered considerable difficulty in getting a church building approved. Agus Setiawan, who works for the church overseeing the construction of new buildings, went to Bekasi in 1996 to seek approval from the local leaders for general approval to build a church at a yet undetermined location. He went to seven different levels of political authority from the local neighborhood leader up through larger geographic divisions, eventually, up, eventually ending up at the mayor's office. It took one and a half years to navigate the various administrative levels, and in the end, he was unsuccessful in gaining permission. Indonesian law requires approval from a certain number of neighbors to ever even begin to build a place of worship. By this time, church leaders had come to realize that if a church was to be built in Bekasi, it would have to be in a non-residential area. And so a three-story parcel was purchased in the isolated cor corner of a strip mall type office retail housing complex called the RUCO, short for Ruma Toko or house store. And generally the store is on the first level and the house is on the upper two levels. The three stories were then remodeled, and you can see here's the entrance, and then it's these three stories. So it's that section right there is the church. Um, the three stories were then remodeled to include classrooms on the first floor, a chapel on the second floor, and a multi-purpose room on the third floor. There is an angel Moroni on the front door to identify it as a Mormon church, but there is no official name of the church on the building, a steeple, or any other religious markings to identify it as a church. On this picture taken from the roof of the church, looking out to the east, you can see um, that the um, retail complex abuts a residential community, and you can see one and two mosques. There are about eight mosques surrounding this retail um, structure, um, but they don't care because they don't see or hear, and it doesn't look like a church. And um, currently there are about, there are four um, Christian churches renting or buying um, re retail areas in that um, strip mall um, because they too can't get approval to build um, chapels in, in Bekasi. On the, in the West Jakarta suburb of Tangran, which also has two branches, opposition by neighbors and administrative leaders to the building of any Christian churches led the LDS church to, to seek refuge in another retail complex. So here you can see the main road. Here's the front of that retail complex but not wanting to draw attention to the church, the church decided to locate on the back isolated side of this retail complex. And here you can see the LDS church is 
one, two, three, four, five storefronts, two stories. The only marker is this. You can't see it very well, but it's an OSZA, which is Indonesia for LDS. So that's all that is there is just LDS above one of the doors. Um, and they have remodeled um, the inside. This is the chapel interior. It takes up four of the storefronts. And then upstairs are the classrooms and the offices. On a more positive note, in 2001, Subandrio went to Surabaya to obtain permission to build a second LDS chapel. The person selling the property was a friend of the mayor, and so he told Subandrio to write a letter of application for a building permit and take it to the mayor, who was a Muslim, for approval. <clears throat> Subandrio delivered the letter to the mayor, who then granted permission. Subandrio then took the letter to the lower administrative officials for their approval. They had no choice but to approve what the mayor had already approved. The large chapel was completed and dedicated in 2002. In Christian Manado in northern Sulawesi, the opposition to the church has come from fellow Christians. Last year, the church was drawn front and center into a religious debate about whether or not the Mormon church was Christian or whether it was a false religion. The de debate began when elders traveled to a nearby city to teach a young man named Rusty, seen here in the blue shirt, whose sister had joined the church while working in Singapore. Christian neighbors objected and took the two missionaries to the police station for questioning. They were soon released, but a reporter got word of Mormons in jail and published an article, which then started a whole string of newspaper articles, many of them front page focusing on the church. And here you can see the Hill Cumorah, the Angel Moroni statue, the Book of Mormon, the branch president, the chapel at the time, um, describing how there are only 45 members in um, northern Sulawesi. <clears throat> At the center of the debate was President Bobby Mongan, now in his 20th year as branch president. The media exposure brought to light that there was no record of the LDS Church having been granted official recognition by the provincial government. And just so you, here's President Mongan on the front page, and it says, we believe in Jesus, we also celebrate um, Christmas and Easter. So he's trying to say, you know, we are Christian, you know, please accept us, um, is what he was hoping. To gain permission, the church needed the approval of three Christian pastors. None would give it. So President Jensen and Elder Subandrio invited a group of religious leaders and pastors from Manado to fly to Jakarta to see the church in action. They spent two days learning about church doctrine, visiting the mission home and church offices, and attending Sunday meetings and even a baptismal service. They were surprised to see that Mormons had Sunday school classes centered on the Old Testament, and that baptisms were done in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost. While favorably impressed, few were willing to stand up for the church. Finally, Jason Lasse in Tan, who is the Director General of Christian Affairs in the Department of Religion and who participated in BYU's Law and Religion Symposium a few years ago, traveled to Monado and told a gathering of pastors that he had visited Utah and met many Mormons and found them to be good Christians. He also told them that if Jakarta can give, can give approval to the LDS Church at the national level, then the province of Northern Sulawesi can certainly do so too. In the end, three pastors finally gave their approval. This big to-do actually turned out to be a good thing for the church. With official approval, the church was able to rent space in a strip mall for a chapel in central Manado. And it's in this strip mall here, right um, there. Um, so instead, now the, the members of the church can meet in central Monado instead of a house that was used as a chapel out in the rural areas and, and was hard to reach. Um, here you can see the strip mall church, and there is prominently displayed is the, the name of the church, which is now okay in Christian Monado because we have official recognition. When I was in Indonesia last month conducting interviews, I had the opportunity to meet with many wonderful members. One couple was Brother Sianto and Sister Yanti from Bandung. They shared their conversion story with me. One day in 1999, Sianto bought a Book of Mormon, the Kitab Mormon, at a used bookstore. He read it and believed, but didn't know what church used the Book of Mormon. He never noticed the name of the church in the front of the book. He had read in 3 Nephi that the church would be known by the name of Jesus Christ. So I looked in the phone book and found four churches in Bandung that have the name of Jesus, that have Jesus Christ in their name. He was attracted to the name, he was attracted to the one that said Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. So he called on Sunday and asked when meetings were. The next Sunday he decided to give the church a try, still not knowing if it was the Book of Mormon Church. 
as, as he was walking in through the gate to the chapel that you see here, he saw a teenage member carrying her Book of Mormon. And from that, he knew he was in the right place. He was taught and baptized. Later, he converted his fiance. She joined because in a dream, her mother came to her and told her that if she married, then her family needed to all follow the same religion and that it was okay for her to follow her future husband's religion. They were married eight months later. She was 38 at the time and he was 33. They tried to conceive for several months with no luck, so they made it a matter of prayer. Within three weeks, she conceived. A year after their marriage, they welcomed cute little Christine into their home. She is now one years old. She nearly died from dengue fever a few months ago, but a priest of blessing helped, her, helped heal her. This abbreviated account of the growth of the church, of the Christian church in a Muslim country, shows that in spite of many obstacles and challenges, Christianity and Islam can coexist and that they can often work together for a common good. The growth of the church has been accomplished through friendships, through humanitarian giving, giving, through patiently waiting, and through the dedicated and consecrated service of many wonderful people. With strong roots now established, the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints is ready to shine forth and bring forth much fruit. Thank you very much. <laughs>